Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, honorable members. It's, uh, it's uh, an honor for our team uh, to be invited to um, collaborate with uh, public servants in the Ministry of Health um, on uh, the uh, providing support to the committee. And it's a personal honor to be here today representing that work with you. My understanding, uh, housekeeping wise, is that uh, slides will be uh, presented um, and, and I'll, I'll signal when I'm moving forward. So I'm still on my first slide, if, if that's visible to you. Um, with no further ado, the, the, um, uh, the, the next slide, rapid review is um, a central part of what I'll be uh, addressing today. And I'm going to begin by providing just a, a, a quick orientation, hopefully something that looks very familiar to um, members um, of the uh, of the committee. Um, I, I proceeded in overly great haste and I'll I'll, I'll try to um, avoid that in the in, in, in the future. Uh, please allow me to pause now to um, um, note that um, I'm speaking with you today from my family's home in uh, beautiful North Vancouver, British Columbia, which is also unceded territory of Coast Salish peoples. Um, ret returning now, if I may, to the uh, to the um, slides, the um, the scope of the review that we that we are undertaking and that I'll be uh, providing an, an an interim report on as part of my remarks is uh, outlined here. It, it has a few clauses, and as I'd mentioned, um, I hope these are familiar to members of the committee. There are a couple of slight modifications to the mandate um, in order to provide us with um, what I hope is the, an appropriate um, refinement. So the first clause under definition of safe supply is uh, the provision of pharmaceutical agents. Uh, the second clause is um, about the population of interest and it is to people who are addicted to or dependent on these substances and who are at high risk for poisoning or other adverse outcomes and third which is also related to um, the, the the nature of the intervention these um, uh, agents would be provided for um, uh, unwitnessed consumption if the individual wished and via their preferred route of administration um, the outcomes of particular interest are listed below. So safe supply in relation to fatal, non-fatal overdoses, um, more generally the health or safety of individuals or communities, and a couple of examples, crime or drug diversion are listed there, and then any other potential benefits. Next slide, please. The, um, the, with that uh, definitional um, a point addressed. The, the outline of my remarks is, is as follows. I, I'll make reference to some of the uh, early framing of opioid prescribing and uh, programs for the treatment of addiction, followed by um, uh, an emer the emergence of uh, two separate systems of care. I'll move on to describe why British Columbia is um, a, uh, a, an important and uh, relevant exemplar um, for uh, for understanding safe supply and its emergence. Uh, an interim um, uh, review of the results of, of our um, of our um, um, uh, investigation of safe supply and then a few um, related uh, perspectives for your for your consideration drawn from addiction research. Next please. Um, I, I'd like to uh, in introduce as part of the context for my for my presentation, um, uh, a couple of uh, home truths from the field of addiction. This uh, relatively simple looking figure um, w was introduced as definitional of of harm reduction or part of the definition of harm reduction. Uh, you can see that there are really two main components, one above the other. And one is the volume of substance consumed. And below is the um, related, but not entirely uh, uh, synonymous um, aspect of risk, where excessive use is, is associated with more risk, abstinence, the lowest possible risk. And harm reduction is movement um, to, uh, to the right. Um, it, is, uh, uh, it does not require abstinence. 
and it does not require any particular form of intervention. Um, seat belts in the 1970s were harm reduction for driving. In the future with um, self-driving automobiles that have near perfect safety records, seat belts may no longer be necessary as means of reducing harm. Um, similarly, uh, um, safe, uh, uh, supervised consumption sites are essential in settings where there are numbers of people uh, living homeless and using drugs. But um, if one is committed to providing housing and support for individuals, then the relative need for services like consumption sites decreases. Um, the, um, the, the other point I'd like to make here is that um, uh, the achievement, the subjective achievement of recovery from addiction emerged as an area of research after harm reduction, but it can be superimposed on this figure. Um, individuals experience recovery, uh, that is, they are fundamentally no longer experiencing addicted. It's a qualitative state. It's defined best by the individual themselves. And the likelihood that recovery is synonymous with abstinence is higher when an individual's addiction was uh, very severe. However, it is abundantly clear from literature that individuals experience recovery from addiction without necessarily achieving abstinence. And um, so I'll mention that by way of, by way of, of background. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, this is a, now a, 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 an observation that the, 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 the source here is more than 20 years old. The observation is far more than 20 years old that um, individuals recover from alcohol and drug problems, including addictions, without necessarily encountering treatment. And in fact, this is a that this is a common occurrence. You can may you may be able to see from the title of the um, of the article that that the that the context for this is a social context. The authors are pointing out the role of um, social capital. Uh, that's a a, a multi uh, faceted uh, concept. Social capital. Uh, subsequent to this paper, some people working in the area have um, um, reframed social capital as recovery capital, intending to shine a spotlight on the facets of social capital that contribute most to recovery. But for our purposes, I, I, I think social capital conveys the, the, the central idea effectively. And um, when individuals have relatively more relevant social capital, recovery is more readily attainable. And when people don't, investing in shoring up their social capital is typically prerequisite to assisting them in overcoming their addictions. Next slide, please. These um, uh, figures uh, represent at the, at the bottom in the lower left, all of the individuals um, represented in this figure drawn from a population uh, level uh, um, analysis, all of the individuals in the lower left are dependent or um, experiencing addiction with respect to these differing substances, nicotine, uh, alcohol, cannabis, and cocaine. As the figure, as the lines um, ascend, the proportion of each group that continues to experience addiction decreases. At the very top um, of the of the uh, of the figure, um, a score of one would mean no one in the original group any longer experiences um, addiction. Um, from left to right um, is the march of time um, measured in decades, 10, 20, 30, etc. And it's clear from this figure that um, differing substances typically um, require differing periods of time before people are likely to um, experience uh, uh, recovery from addiction or, or, or no longer meet criteria for dependence. Um, nicotine and, uh, uh, pardon me, cannabis and cocaine tend to attenuate uh, more quickly. Those problems tend to resolve more quickly. You can see that the majority of people are no longer dependent by after 10 years while um, alcohol and um, nicotine attenuate over longer periods of time. Paired with the previous observation about social capital and its contributions to recovery, 
we can um, uh, uh, superimpose on this thoughts about um, early in life, recognizing that almost all forms of dependence begin early in adulthood or in adolescence. And so by the time 10 years has passed, we can imagine we're look, looking commonly at people in their 20s, assuming adult responsibilities, entering relationships, and moving forward in ways that are no longer consistent with use of drugs like cannabis and cocaine over longer periods of time. Um, alcohol and uh, nicotine dependence uh, uh, attenuate. They have less severe impacts on daily functioning and, um, and nevertheless attenuate as people experience things like uh, health consequences, um, accidents or arrests involving impaired driving, uh, the birth of children, uh, grandchildren, um, and, uh, and other, other types of catalysts, which people um, typically reference as, as, the, uh, motiv as key motivators for their, um, their, their cessation of use or, or um, uh, the end of their addiction. Next slide, please. I, me I mentioned in my outline uh, the importance of BC. This, is, this slide is um, uh, developed from uh, um, Senate materials um, set from the Canada's Senate in 1955. Um, and as, as you can see, a tallying of individuals referred to as addicted. They're presented in different categories reflecting the, um, the origins of, um, of addiction. Um, um, having first uh, been uh, prevalent among um, um, professionals, that being medical professionals, physicians, pharmacists, people with access to um, opioids and, and other drugs. Um, the, um, the medical addicts are the individuals, and forgive my, I'm simply using the same terminology as, as the slide here, but, but uh, the, the medical category are individuals who, um, whose addiction is deemed to be a product of prescribing. Uh, so these would be patients, um, typically. And the left column, uh, so-called criminal addicts, is the one that um, exploded in numbers uh, in the, uh, uh, the middle part of the last century, in particular following the Second World War. Um, you can see here BC uh, has by far the highest numbers of so-called criminal addicts, not necessarily the most medical or professional, but those numbers are dwarfed by, uh, by those deemed to be uh, criminal. This uh, emergence, the phenomenon of, this, of the growth of this, of this particular problem was a catalyst for um, uh, immediate reforms, which then had a have a have, are are the legacy that we've inherited today, and in some ways are are trying to uh, remedy. Next slide, please. I mentioned the catalytic role. Um, this was uh, um, in the nineteen in the late nineteen fifties. Um, uh, cl clinical researchers in both Canada and the U.S. were uh, funded. Um, by, by their respective governments to attempt to intervene in um, the lives of people deemed to be criminal um, and addicted. Uh, the, the thinking behind the intervention is summarized here. This is uh, the definition of, of rehabilitation. These are uh, quotes taken entirely from the, uh, the researchers' presentation of findings. The results of these programs were reported as extremely successful. You'll see from from um, from these few slides. Um, importantly, the um, the role of of medication or um, and, and methadone in this context was as an inducement and as a transitional aid into treatment, whereas rehabilitation is defined as activities in the social world, almost foreshadowing what we subsequently came to refer to as social capital or recovery capital. Um, next slide, please. The, uh, the aim being to free the individual from dependency. Um, the, uh, um, but these changes in the social world often being um, essential to achieve first. Um, my comments on, on social capital. And the cardinal principle being uh, patience and, and uh, the persistent provision of support to individuals. Next slide, please. 
The, the Canadian research is uh, eclipsed uh, in the literature uh, for its influence by um, the work of, of these researchers, in particular, Marie Nyswander and uh, her uh, husband, Vincent Dole. Um, and you can see from this headline in JAMA, um, they are uh, out of the gate reporting a blockbuster success. Um, they're reporting in, in the, in, this is the abstract, 94% success ending criminal activity. And what was that due to? Next slide, please. They report the remarkable achievement of social productivity, stable employment, responsible behavior. They go on to say this, of course, cannot be attributed to the medication which merely blocks drug hunger. They go on to explain that the achievement of this social productivity, something that the Portuguese described as social reintegration, was achieved through their, the interactions between their patients and humans that provided them with the supports and pathways forward in order to make a success of their lives in these various domains. Next slide, please. The catalyst for these early methadone programs I, I referred to, there was a subsequent catalyst for the expansion of, of so-called narcotic addiction treatment um, arising in the, uh, co coinciding with the reporting of these findings. Um, and one of the um, major catalysts, especially a, a U.S. catalyst, was the specter of some 20,000 returning servicemen addicted to heroin. Very careful research and fascinating research covering uh, this phenomenon. The, um, uh, the, the cutting to the chase, very few and almost almost none of the returning servicemen required any form of treatment in order to overcome their addiction. They described it was it was not because they didn't have access to heroin or or, or uh, something of that nature. It was that their the lives that they were returning to were inherently of greater value to them than continuing to use heroin. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, this era um, was uh, uh, the largest single expansion in spending on addiction treatment in uh, North American history, certainly in U.S. history, a tenfold um, uh, increase. Next slide, please. Those original authors, uh, Dole and Nicewander, um, commented extremely critically um, on, the, uh, on the rollout of um, narcotic addiction treatment uh, bearing uh, the, the name of, of, of their intervention, methadone maintenance treatment. And in particular, uh, they pointed out, first of all, that it's not that the programs are no longer attracting um, uh, individuals who are in need of help. And the reason they are not is that they overemphasize, uh, as they describe it, a chemical agent, and that the chemical agent can have very little effect on, in, on transforming people's lives. They go on to describe uh, in terms that I think we can understand uh, quite easily the kinds of things that are um, much more urgently needed and yet um, were not provided and remain um, conspicuous in their absence from methadone treatment uh, today. Next slide, please. Confirmation of the um, uh, the harm that we all experience as a result of um, losing the plot and focusing on uh, biochemical interventions as opposed to human ones is illustrated here. Um, the likelihood of of um, overdose mortality, or more more correctly, poisoning mortality, is um, powerfully related to um, uh, unemployment. When people are are employed and absent from work, their their uh, their likelihood of of uh, poisoning is 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 comparatively low, but unemployment um, uh, is uh, second only to disability, um, which is also uh, coincident typically with underemployment or unemployment uh, in this population. Next slide, please. Um, Going from the individual level, if we look at um, 
areas where people are um, uh, are living, um, there is a a high correspondence between so uh, communities which are deemed to be socially deprived and the likelihood of both opioid prescribing and um, poisoning mortality. Next slide. Please. Um, our work in BC illustrates that um, rather than being an inducement into a program of uh, social reintegration, people receiving methadone um, here are um, enrolled an average of eight years during which they commit um, uh, uh, ongoing numbers of both nonviolent and violent offenses, but the opposite of Dolan Nicewinder's findings. Next slide, please. We have um, on the left, we have uh, uh, increasing between 2008 and 2017, uh, sharp increases in the numbers of people who are involuntarily admitted to hospital in BC, where the primary reason is substance use disorder, that, that rising from 1887 to 45, 36. Next slide. During the same period of time, we have sharply increasing uh, no, proportions of people in our correctional institutions. This is provincial custody. And uh, the lines are illustrating the uh, the increasing proportions of people who are held in custody and who have been diagnosed with a substance use disorder um, with or without a mental disorder um, prior to entering custody. And in the most recent year, 2017, available to us, it's 70% of the custody population. Next slide. Um, importantly, the overlap, which I alluded to briefly with mental illness, is substantial and um, several studies, this is one of them, are um, now reporting the, the, the high degree of suicidality among people who survive poisonings and referring to their state of mind at the time that they experienced the poisoning episode. The likelihood of experiencing suicidal intent increases with the number of prior poisonings. Next slide. Um, social social uh, capital, if I if I may, this one is illustrating that one of those groups that that I showed early on, the um, medical so-called medical addicts, sorry, professional addicts, uh, this being physicians, that um, physicians are um, uh, assisted in overcoming addictions um, through programs that emphasize social and psychological supports framed around the uh, the social capital that they have retained during their addictions and without any opioid substitution therapy. Um, it's almost the complement of what people in the public system receive, which is an opioid substitution therapy and very little, if any, uh, support with things like work, improved housing and uh, social reintegration. Next slide. Um, I met, mentioned Portugal's national drug strategy. I draw your attention only to the lower of the two quotes, which is drawn from their, their guidance document that, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as treatment, as they define it, without social reintegration. Next slide. We do have high quality studies uh, that build the opportunities for social reintegration. This, this is actually a cost effectiveness uh, paper based on several randomized control trials, and this is uh, an intervention known variously as recovery-oriented housing, also synonymously harm reduction housing. If you recall the the line figure that I that I began with, those two terms are um, uh, interchangeable in in the sense that uh, a focus on persistently reducing harms is likely to improve individuals' opportunities to experience recovery. Um, this, this, this is an intervention that costs about $38,000 a year, by the way. Next slide. This is how people describe um, their experiences in these interventions and give some insight into the journey people who have been homeless. Individuals in this trial have been homeless for an average of 10 years, struggling with serious mental illnesses and addictions. And here we see there, in their words, um, how their experience of support uh, contributes and lays a foundation to their um, uh, opportunities to recover from both addiction and mental illness. Next slide. 
uh, this intervention has been shown to um, uh, it's it's highly robust. It works its work across Canada. It's been replicated in four cities in France, also using randomized controlled trials. Um, it reduces reoffending uh, by about 50% in the first year compared to usual care. Next slide. It also reduces emergency department visits by about the same amount, 50%. And this is using administrative data. So we're not, I'm not, I'm not reporting things based on people's self-report, but on our uh, surveillance systems that, um, um, in, in, uh, in BC. Next slide, please. Now I'm sort of tipping um, the, by, by referring to study quality, I'd like to briefly introduce that there is a, an occasionally debated, uh, but, but nevertheless uh, widely respected uh, concept of levels of evidence. And um, as background to our um, review of, of literature addressing safe supply, we are following this uh, relatively traditional outline, which prioritizes reviews of randomized controlled trials in, in interventions where people are uh, assigned a chance to receive one of two interventions. This gives us the highest degree of confidence that if there are differences between the two groups, it's due to the intervention and not other things, uh, followed by individual randomized control trials, or it's possible to do uh, uh, to basically emulate a randomized trial, but without true randomization. Lower would be case control studies uh, or retrospective cohorts, where at least there is a comparison, uh, case reports, um, and then last uh, reasoning. Um, the, the note added here by the um, Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine is that uh, any individual study could be graded down in relation to a research question, if uh, it doesn't align with the purpose of the review, in our, in our case, this review of safe supply, based on um, things like the, the population that's included, the intervention that's tried, or, or other things. We uh, framed our review around uh, the, the population as described in my, in my first slide, uh, the, the drawn from your mandate, John brought from the committee's mandate, the intervention, safe supply, as it was defined. And um, we entered these uh, search terms into the Medline uh, search engine. And uh, next slide, our results were, um, we identified 839 articles. There were no systematic reviews or randomized controlled trials. There were a total of 18 articles that reported original research findings and discussed safe supply. Of the 18, 16 were conducted in Canada, 13 in BC. Uh, I mentioned the importance of BC earlier. This is, this is another um, uh, reminder of that. Findings were based on either interviews or questionnaires. The interviews were often uh, with, were typically with relatively small samples. Nine did not offer a definition of safe supply and, um, and none were designed to examine the outcomes of interest listed on that earlier slide using any kind of objective measure such as uh, administrative data, the, the, the kind of data that I, that I referred to in relation to the reductions in crime and reductions in emergency department visits um, associated with housing um, or any comparison group. Next slide, please. The, the um, results of the papers did show, um, these are the most common themes reported in the results of the papers that we identified, a high prevalence of homelessness, um, often over 90% in the study sample, a high prevalence of unemployment, uh, near 100% in, in some of the studies, high prevalence of food insecurity. And these are all uh, factors strongly implicated in both the causes of addiction and uh, by addressing them, with um, reductions in harm and promotion of, of priority. Only one of the uh, papers reviewed out of 18 focused on uh, addressing these factors as um, an important implication of their results. All of the others uh, overlooked them and instead, next slide, prioritized uh, safe supply, um, even though safe supply per se was typically undefined and not related to their study results. So these are um, a few, the top two are examples um, from uh, 
BC and Canadian authors uh, um, drawing a connection between their findings and uh, the as, as implications for safe supply. Only one article, um, which happened to be from Indonesia, um, interpreted their results in an opposing way and, and said that um, instead it was important to focus on uh, factors that influence the quality of life of the people rather than safe drug use supplies. Next slide, please. There is a, um, a, a difference of basic um, root causes between uh, the, um, those that appear to be advocating for safe supply. That is that the cause of the... Sorry, Dr. Summers, that's the end of the 30 minutes, but if it's the okay. will of the, the committee, I, I would like to put another five minutes on the clock so you can finish your last three slides. Okay. Any concerns? Agreed. Agreed. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Summers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a difference of, of, of root causes and from the perspective, and um, I'm offering this in an effort to make sense of, the, um, of, of this uh, quite peculiar um, set, of, uh, set of studies, um, it, it, it appears that the, um, the, the ability to overlook or the, the, the shared tendency to overlook social factors as causal um, is um, uh, may be motivated, may be motivated by the interpretation that addiction um, in the population of interest to us and of concern to us is caused by the supply of toxic molecules. This is uh, uh, an, an, an unusual, uh, very much against the grain um, view in the area of addiction, um, where much more, uh, well, overwhelmingly, Addictions are understood uh, to be uh, influenced, and, and, and I've used this language of supply and demand, that the demand for addiction is created by um, uh, isolation in these, in these domains, by estrangement from society, by the absence of meaning in life. Among Indigenous colleagues, um, I, I, I often am reminded that this is interpreted as uh, experienced as the loss of all relations or the or, or more succinctly still the loss of connection. Next slide, please. The um, the the overlooking of social determinants of addiction or social causes um, uh, is 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 one aspect of this. There there are other features that are also overlooked and um, in the in advocating for safe supply, and that are important to emphasize. Uh, one is the uh, are, is the the knowns are the known side effects of prescribing these uh, the, the the top two studies you won't be able to read this perhaps but they they come from over 20 years ago the the lower one from 2019 is a systematic review and meta-analysis high quality evidence emphasizing harms associated with long-term prescribing and in this case focusing on 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 markedly heightened sensitivity to pain um, next please next slide other consequences um, or implications, I should say, of advocacy for safe supply include um, the uh, the demand placed on, um, in, in this case, Alberta's provincial formulary. Drug shortages are widely acknowledged uh, across Canada, and one area that is particularly worrisome um, is the our shortages involving anesthetics. Fentanyl is one of the most uh, um, important anesthetics, is, is referenced specifically in this particular paper where um, specialists in anesthesia um, report that, uh, that these shortages result in them providing inferior anesthetics using medications that they're not familiar with. And it must be considered um, what the diversion of a drug like fentanyl uh, into uh, um, uh, other areas would have uh, the implications it would have for surgical planning and um, alternatives. This is not an elastic commodity, um, as, as I'm sure members of the committee are aware. Last slide, please. As we've been conducting our review, we became aware of uh, um, the, the completion of some work by the uh, group um, jointly led by Stanford University and the Lancet Medical Journal. Uh, this review uh, emphasizes the, uh, the importance of commercial um, and profit interests in the perpetuation of the opioid crisis, um, advocates strongly for changes. 
um, but also uh, touches on some of the issues of, of, of interest to uh, our review and, and I think to the committee, emphasizing that policies that should attract skepticism include dispensing drugs from vending machines and prescribing potent opioids and other drugs to individuals with opiate use disorder in hopes of creating a safe addictive drug supply. Um, uh, the authors might have, um, I'm glad they didn't, but they might have simply reframed this as um, policies that should attract skepticism are those espoused by people from British Columbia, which is very much the epicenter of this particular type of advice. And as, I'm, as I've said, I'm, I'm glad they chose not to frame their, their, uh, their review that way. So let me, let me uh, adjourn there um, and uh, thank you again for the additional time. Thank, thank you, Dr. Summers, for, for your presentation. Uh, we're now going to open up for question and answered with the, the members, and, and we will do that until 10.15 a.m., and we're going to start with MLA Rosen. Thank you, Doctor. I have a series of five quick questions for you. They shouldn't take too long. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can confirm uh, that last statement you had that said policies that should attract skepticism include those that include the dispensing of uh, what would be considered a safe supply drugs system. Can you just confirm what the source of that study was, please? Oh, oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Quite right. right. Um, the, the source is the Lancet Commission. Thank you. And you had another definition of rehabilitation, and that definition was to to detoxify addictions and addicts and teach them to function in society without the aid of drugs. Can you also just confirm one more time on the record what that source was? Um, to, uh, the main source was um, uh, Dole, Nicewander, and Warner um, from the Journal of um, the American Medical Association um, in, uh, I believe it's uh, 1968. Thank you. Uh, you had some statistics about the likelihood to overdose of those who are employed versus unemployed. Um, can you just confirm one more time for us as well how significantly the likelihood to overdose increases in individuals who are unemployed compared to those who are, are employed? Um, yep. Yeah, so so um, among people uh, uh, who have been diagnosed with opiate use disorder, um, Unemployment in this study increased the odds of um, of poisoning by um, I believe it was about six times, um, um, and uh, is a is a is an insight into um, the the larger uh, unemployment is also related to uh, a higher likelihood of suicidality, um, and uh, and the onset of employment and support in employment um, leads in the opposite direction. Thank you. And do you have any data that would suggest uh, how many people who are using safe supply drug provision are employed full time or at least on a part time consistent basis versus those who would use safe supply who would not be consistently employed? Well, there, we, we found uh, um, we found no papers um, reporting on uh, the delivery of safe supply as we have defined it based on the committee's mandate. Um, if we're looking at, uh, I, can, I can draw reference to other studies um, where, where drugs like heroin, for example, are prescribed to people. This is on an experimental basis, um, coming uh, to clinic three times a day. In, in those Canadian, uh, in that Canadian research, if I'm not mistaken, uh, over 90% of the patients were unemployed at every time point where, where they were measured. Thank you. And my last question then is, do you have any data to suggest uh, how many of those who are reliant on safe supply, or if we don't have papers uh, on safe supply for opioids, I suppose, um, pres potentially prescription heroin, uh, any data to show how many of those reliant on prescription heroin or opioids uh, go on to get clean and who use that prescription basis as the springboard that gets them clean and rehabilitated um, as the definition from before? Uh in North America, in particular, um, uh, very few, if any. Um, in uh, the Ontario methadone program, for instance, for every additional year that, that a, a woman is receiving methadone, there's a 7% increase 
in the likelihoods of being convicted of a crime. Um, for men, it stays constant. There, it's, it's, uh, um, it's referred to by, by many uh, um, clients, patients, as a form of chemical handcuffs. And I think that's an apt metaphor. Perfect. Thank you. That's all my questions. Excellent. Thank you, Member. Um, we have Emily Yao up next. Uh, Dr. Summers, thank you again for taking the time to speak with our, us and, uh, as we study this uh, very serious issue. Um, as, I went, as you went through the slides, I couldn't help notice there's a certain parallel to Maslow's hierarchy. And for the general audience that's watching all 100 people, uh, that uh, Maslow's hierarchy is, the, is, a, is a study on how humans partake in behavioral uh, motivation. And um, the first step being physiological, if you have things like food and clothing, then you can focus on things like safety, which are job security and housing. And when you have that, then you can focus more on love and belonging, which are your social needs and friendship. Eventually uh, getting to the, to, to the, the pinnacles of uh, working on self-esteem and ultimately self-actualization. Is it safe to say a lot of what you were explaining there really is, is uh, reflects Maslow's hierarchy that, for example, you focused on housing first there, that if we can address the housing needs of a lot of the folks that are, have these addiction issues, that they'll be in a better place to, to, uh, to uh, address their addiction issues. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yep, it is. Uh, I think I think a lot of what what has come to pass in in the field of addiction uh, validates uh, um, Abe's uh, observations about about motivation, um, and uh, and in particular that if we are um, uh, if in the case of that those trials that I referred to the the part of housing first that 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 is has really been um, unsuccessfully translated into practice is um, an emphasis on individuals' own choices and supporting their, uh, in using more psychological terms, their, their sense of agency. And when we are able to emphasize people's agency, like a, a choice of places to live, for instance, which is how we, as opposed to here's your place, a choice of places, and providing people with choices and the supports to um, stand by their choices and learn from them, is the surest path to uh, that we know of to assist people overcoming uh, their mental illness symptoms, their addiction struggles, and is is entirely consistent with the way that Maslow described uh, the the progression that that you summarized. Can follow up, yes, sir. And just to clarify, uh, again, you studied systems like what happened in Portugal, who are considered leaders in uh, addictions and whatnot uh, treatments, and. You mentioned that they emphasize the fact that treatment needs, treatment requires social reintegration. So is that fair to say again, um, that's, you know, under Maslow's hierarchy, that is like the social needs, the friendship under love and biology, uh, belonging. That, uh, again, if we're addressing the physiological issues, the safety issues, the, the, the love and belonging, and that they can start to focus on the self-esteem and ultimately the self-actualization, and that those are... That is what other nations have identified, again, that are consistent with what you've just said, that if we address all those issues beforehand, housing, uh, their safety, their shelter, that, uh, as well as love and, and whatnot, that uh, they're in a better place to, to fight these addictions. Yes? Yes, absolutely that, and, and uh, reinforced by that, um, as I pointed out, the high prevalence of suicidal intent and suicidal thoughts, the, um, the, the, the best response we have to help people transcend that kind of state of despair is, involves the same elements that, um, I, that we're emphasizing uh, or that are emphasized in, in helping people overcome addictions. It is, it is summarized as establishing lives that are worth living. Thank you, sir. So, thank you, member. Uh, we next have Emily Milliken. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Summers, for being here uh, today. I recognize that uh, the purposes of your presentation today is to uh, essentially go over uh, a review of the literature as, as, as what is already out there. Um, I guess one of my questions, uh, I'm, having, I'm, ha I'm struggling a little bit in the sense that what I'm getting from this presentation, I believe, is that it would be fair to say that there isn't too much high-quality evidential-based research out there 
as um, currently dealing with safe supply. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Both for or against. So I'm not even looking at it from the perspective of whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. What I'm looking for potentially is is whether or not there's essentially what you're saying is as of right now the literature out there is lacking. It is it is lacking with respect to um, uh, safe supply as it's as the term is being used um, today. There there uh, so that is leading to evidence supporting the increased prescribing of drugs as your committee has, has, has uh, provided by way of example, as a means of reducing harms in the population. There is a, a lot of evidence that is not using the term safe supply that, um, in, that, that demonstrates the likely harmfulness of of implementing um, activity um, as as as, the, as safe supply is defined here, then that's what led the Lancet Commission to 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 their conclusion that this is uh, uh, a, a, one of the recommendations to be skeptical of. So so there's so so there is there is a, in our review we were searching for evidence where the authors are are presenting findings and are then recommending an, an increase in uh, in prescribing. Um, what we found in that 839 uh, tranche of papers was that most of the authors that used the term safe supply were using it in relation to reduced prescribing. We did not include those papers because that's not the sense of the term as, as the committee is, is, is using it. But, the, but there's, there's, there is a, a, if we had searched for literature on evidence to support reduced prescribing, harms of prescribing, side effects of drugs, we would be overwhelmed, and those that is, it's that source of literature, as I said, that is um, being referenced in the Lancet Commission's overall interpretation that this is um, uh, um, not a, a credible pathway to reducing suffering, as against others where there is much stronger evidence. Thanks, and just as a quick follow-up, it would be my expectation that individuals either for or against safe supply as defined with regards to this, um, this committee would be rushing to create evidence-based uh, resources to rely on. Do you know of any ongoing studies that may be happening? Uh, yes, there have been. Uh, there, we, we've come across, for example, uh, descriptions of studies that have been published. Uh, so they're not presenting results yet. They're outlining the protocols um, that they are uh, planning to follow in order to generate findings. Um, uh, but uh, um, you know, I, I'd hasten to, to add that um, when uh, deployed among people who are homeless, unemployed, uh, suicidal, living with serious mental illnesses and in states of despair, it is at least perplexing why in, in investigators would choose to focus on leaving those aspects of people's um, lives untouched when they are directly implicated in, in the likelihood of recovery and instead focusing on the marginal gains that may be achievable by prescribing drugs to them while they remain in those abject states of poverty and despair. Thanks. You have a follow-up member? Good. Okay. okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we now have uh, Emily Amory up. Good morning, uh, Dr. Summers, and thank you very much for this uh, incredibly informative uh, presentation that you've provided. I think all of us committee members are in debt to you for your time and your, uh, your expertise in this area. Doctor, this committee uh, is, as you know, tasked with examining several aspects of safe supply, including whether there is any evidence that a proposed safe supply would have an impact on fatal or non-fatal overdose. Uh, drug diversion or associated health and community impacts. Uh, you know, this is a broad and general question because I think that all of us committee members are here to uh, learn as much as we can about this particular issue. And so with that in mind, is there any evidence that access to a safe supply of opioids, heroin, crystal meth, cocaine, or other substances, for example, for people who are addicted to or dependent on these substances, uh, reduce the likelihood uh, suffering a fatal or a non-fatal overdose? 
there's 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 no direct evidence because um, uh, I am not aware of any government or um, oversight body making uh, drugs like cocaine or crystal meth available to people whether they are um, addicted or not. And the 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 evidence of the relationship between more prescribing or more available more availability of drugs and harms is is massive. There there is an, an extremely strong correlation um, witnessed most recently in the um, in the so-called oxycodone era and that crisis. Um, What's so so? There's there there um, the, there's no direct evidence for the reasons that I've described. It would it would simply be um, uh, illegal on an international scale, and I think that that suppresses governments' willingness to to sort of buck international treaties and and do things like prescribing crystal meth or making them available to people. But uh, there is a uh, it would go against um, all of the known evidence relating to harms of drugs. And also, as I've mentioned, um, form form a very kind of perplexing opportunity cost. Why uh, I don't know how many of, if you if if any of your staff have done a back of napkin estimate of what it would cost to provide fentanyl to uh, individuals on an annual basis. Our our sketch um, is that it would uh, very quickly for fentanyl alone go past six figures. And, and while people remain homeless and nobody's helping them with their employment, we're ignoring reconciliation as a, and, and, and the project of reconciliation as a contributor to reduce addiction. So why ignore all those things, given cost-effectiveness trials showing uh, that interventions that, 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 that cost a fraction of that amount um, are highly effective at supporting people in their ascent of Maslow's hierarchy? Um, and 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 instead prioritize something that um, is uh, um, completely contraindicated by available evidence. It smacks of interests that go beyond those of the health of the individuals that we are attempting to uh, to support. I'll take one more follow up. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Summers, once again. Now, my colleagues here early this morning have brought up some various examples of jurisdictions, if you will. Uh, that ex uh, have applied or are attempting to apply a sort of safe uh, supply model. Uh, my colleague Taniel uh, brought up the example of Portugal earlier today in his question, and we have one model of uh, proposed safe supply here in Canada, at least uh, as, as uh, in, in, in BC as, as one form of what they might purport to suggest is a safe supply model. I understand that the evidence suggests from, from your answer here and the answers prior to today that there are there is sufficient evidence that exists, uh, independent, credible evidence for harms uh, of subs uh, um, prescribing or re uh, reduced prescribing, if you will. You also mentioned that there are credible, uh, there's, there is credible evidence that suggests that prescribing or safe supply does not achieve its intended purpose. I'm wondering if you can comment on whether or not you have any information to provide this committee with respect to how the jurisdictions that are implementing these policies or how uh, the jurisdictions that are contemplating these approaches justify the uh, introduction of safe supply and or uh, reduced prescribing practices uh, and, and um, indicate that it is the correct path given the evidence that you're, you're bringing up here and saying, uh, given the evidence that you're suggesting is overwhelmingly in favor of not proceeding towards this type of practice? Um, well, there, in, in BC, um, where, where I call home, um, there, there is a longstanding um, disinterest in addressing social determinants of addiction. Um, when 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 I brought up uh, at the beginning of the uh, the, the public health emergency, um, and back when I was still invited to meetings um, here, uh, I brought up the uh, um, the 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 glaring to me um, um, involvement of um, um, re re uh, the absence of reconciliation with with indigenous peoples as as a contributor to their overrepresentation among decedents are um, abysmal record of 
uh, transitioning from institutional to community-based care for mental illness as a, uh, a, a, as, a, as a means of explaining the overrepresentation of people with mental illness among those who are, who are at risk, um, the increasing numbers of youth who are um, uh, displaced from, from housing and, and um, means of, of supporting themselves economically. And there was an absolute disinterest in considering um, any further examination of um, risk factors in the social world as it contributes to the risk of poisoning. The emphasis was on that it's an equal opportunity risk and the only uh, viable means of addressing it is by, pres is by prescribing medications and getting people connected to, uh, to the provincial formulary. Um, it was in entirely a supply oriented uh, focus um, I think people, frankly, have their heads in the sand um, and perhaps are uh, intimidated by the scale of addressing these social determinants. Uh, but other experiences, such as that of Portugal, emphasize, as, as does uh, as do almost all of the successful treatment studies, including those that I've referred to today, all show that successfully overcoming addictions is achievable and is achieved best by promoting social reintegration, using familiar structures to, to all of us uh, participating today, work, home, family, meaningful um, uh, elements of life. Um, Portugal's turnaround uh, came without anything like safe supply. They're, they they used methadone, consistent with the studies that I've referred to earlier. Um, and, and on a far more important uh, um, le level, um, involved housing and support. In fact, they, they, they emphasized housing to such a degree that even though they were addressing homelessness and poisoning fatalities, they did not need to introduce a single consumption site, normally something that would be a stock in trade when uh, a, a large population of homeless individuals are using drugs. They were able to bypass the need for a consumption site because they prioritized rapid uh, rehousing of individuals along with other forms of support that enabled them to be self-sufficient. Excellent. Next we have uh, MLA Stefan. Great. Thank, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, one of the arguments that I think, um, at least that I that I've heard in favor of safe supply, and I'd be interested in your response, is that um, some would assert that, uh, but for providing uh, safe supply, uh, individuals uh, would die because they would be taking uh, tainted drugs. I know that would be a common argument. Um, I'm just wondering what you would say in response to that argument that but for safe supply, uh, individuals will access tainted drugs that will cause them to die. Yeah, so um, so keeping in mind so this keeping in mind this 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 highly speculative um, environment in which this so-called safe supply is is being described. Um, I mean, the, 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 the term itself is sort of, it obscures, um, I think, uh, the meaning of what we're describing. But, but um, if, if we were to, you know, we proceed with individuals, let's say, as I've, as I've, as I've alluded to, experiencing um, homelessness, social exclusion, joblessness, friendlessness, uh, really, a, a, and, and, a, and often a, a lifelong lack of support. About a quarter of the people that we've worked with um, uh, meeting those criteria are we're also in um, uh, um, ex experience a, a severe adverse childhood um, um, uh, uh, events. Um, and and so this is a lifelong pattern. And now we have a choice, we and you, um, have a have a choice. We could approach that that very that person at immediate risk, as you've described, and say, uh, based on randomized control trial results and cost effectiveness results, at about thirty eight thousand dollars a year, we could say today, 
I have uh, um, some options of housing available that we could go and look at this afternoon um, and uh, to be followed by support obtaining employment. 80% plus of the people that we meet and interview in this dynamic say that on the day we meet them, that they want to pursue paid employment and about 60% have worked for at least one year consecutively in the past. They have it in their repertoire. So we can approach people for that relatively small cost with these types of choices. And yes, support in using drugs more safely, reducing harms, proceeding uh, in the direction toward recovery, one small step at a time. We could do that today. Invest in people, show them that we believe that they have more to achieve in life and that they have worth. Or for an as yet uncalculated but vastly greater sum of money, we could approach someone and say, I can see quite clearly that you're suffering psychologically. I can see quite clearly that you're suffering due to exposure and a lack of place to live. I'm going to not talk to you about those things. I'm going to ignore them as though they're somehow insoluble. Instead, how would you like a free supply of the drugs that you're taking addictively? I'll do that. Now, what, what kind of message is that to the person? Yes, it would be arguably better than nothing, but through that very act, we're confirming their, that their, their, their perceived worthlessness, um, that this is the best we can do, when in fact we can do much better and, and people in need of assistance consistently say they want more. Um, they're not, people are not asking, when they're seeking help, they're not asking for a safe supply of drugs. A large Scottish study of people seeking help with their opioid and polysubstance addictions uh, reported that over 50% were seeking help primarily to get off drugs, and that less than 2% were seeking help using drugs more safely. So this is uh, not something that has a grassroots uh, uh, component to it, it is something that is being uh, um, somehow introduced from outside. Thank you, Member. Did you have a follow-up? Yes, Staff? please. Thank yes, you. sir. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate the distinction between uh, recovery and harm reduction uh, type of discussion there. Um, would you say, just to kind of clarify in terms of literature and the concept of safe supply, would you say there's a distinction between using uh, prescriptions to wean people off uh, drugs for the purposes of recovering from addictions versus prescribing to protect individuals in their addictions from tainted drugs? Um, in terms of your the search of literature and, and the discussion of safe supply, is there a distinction there between, again, prescribing as a means to move people off being addicted? Um, and perhaps my understanding is methadone, I think, sometimes is used for that purpose. I stand to be corrected there. Um, versus prescribing people with... Uh, clean, I guess, drugs that aren't tainted, but not really used for the purposes of moving people off addictions and towards recovery. Can you comment on that, those two differences in terms of safe supply? Um, yeah, as, as, as yet, there, there is, there is uh, um, no literature um, on um, um, prescribing drugs like crystal meth and cocaine to individuals. Um, and uh, so, so there's, there is nothing on that side of the ledger in response to your question. Um, and there are um, uh, many, many good reasons why proceeding in that direction um, would be uh, potentially uh, injurious to the, uh, to the recipients, to patients. 
Um, the, the, our physiology doesn't know where the molecules came from, and individuals who are using drugs in combinations um, uh, are, are, at, are at high risk, regardless of where they get their drugs from. Receiving prescription drugs is no assurance that individuals would no longer be um, purchasing uh, additional drugs and using them. We have evidence that, that uh, about 50% um, of the people receiving methadone in, in our work with, with those experiencing homelessness and mental illness, 50% are using um, illicit drugs uh, at the same time um, every day. So the, um, there's, there's very little reason to believe that um, individuals, that, that, that first of all, that this project would be successful um, at displacing use of illicitly procured drugs and it, as I've said a couple of times now, it is simply bewildering that um, that that form of intervention would be prioritized above others that have far more evidence of effectiveness and would simply also be cheaper. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Member. Next up, we have uh, Emily Milliken. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to to ask another question here. Um, in jurisdictions uh, where safe supply is being provided, and by that I mean in regards to ensuring or trying to ensure um, that people who are taking these drugs aren't getting uh, tainted drugs, which of course I think the line of logic would then lead to um, an increase uh, in overdoses. Uh, do you know or, or did you find in your research uh, any studies or study that shows safe supply is associated with harm reduction both to users and or the community or I guess on top of that uh, it, it, whether or not it's associated with a decrease in overdose deaths in the in those jurisdictions no excellent that was quick thank you yeah uh, any other members we have about uh, two minutes left for questions any other questions uh, okay Emily yeah I guess I'm wondering if uh, Dr. Summers, if you could sum up your presentation for us here as a, uh, in a general, are you able to do that? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, the, there is a, a large volume of evidence bearing on how best to assist people who are um, um, at greatest risk of poisoning. And the pathway that has the highest evidence and the large volume of evidence focuses on, I'll put it this way, uh, events in the social world, things in our social world, things outside of our skin, um, interactions with other people, opportunities, um, and, and we've discussed a number of them here today, individuals um, struggling uh, with inadequate housing or homelessness, with um, an absence of, of, of employment opportunities, um, and, and, and thereby an absence of means to support themselves, to be uh, reintegrated in society. Those activities should be prioritized. Alternatively, um, the focus on safe supply, as, as we've seen in the papers we've reviewed, um, despite measuring these uh, types of obvious social deficiencies in people's lives, chooses not to prioritize them at all, and instead focuses on an intervention that would only work if it was to work by having some effect within our skin, by changing somehow uh, the, uh, the, the individual's um, 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 experience of drugs, risk of drugs, and there is simply no evidence that drugs on their own, as mentioned by Dolan Nicewander, a mere, that a mere chemical agent is capable of contributing to a meaningful change. Um, so my, the upshot of this presentation and I think of experience in the field of addiction, especially over the last 50 years, emphasizes that individuals are highly capable of change, far more so than we usually give people credit for, and that their ability to uh, pursue change um, is a function of the, the social opportunities that are made available to them and the support to take full advantage of those, of those social opportunities. So I, I commend to the committee to consider 
uh, uh, examining uh, those kinds of approaches that would emphasize uh, social capital um, and um, and to uh, um, um, have a sense of belief uh, in the capabilities we're trying to assist. I, I, I hate, oh, there you go, that sounded like a conclusion. Thank you, Dr. Summers. Sorry, I was gonna interrupt you, but it sounded like we, end, uh, I, I, that was good timing, so thank you for that.